Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here. I think everyone here seems to be in East Africa. I see a lot of familiar names. Thank you for those Kenyans who have come along with me for this meeting. This is brilliant. I have not been at a Rotary meeting in a very, very long time. So I really appreciate the, the invitation. Anthony is a friend of mine we met online. Our lives have seemed to go online. I like the preamble to this meeting. I like the conversation about winning because here we are talking about my book, Play to Win. Now, Anthony and I had a conversation about what I would like to come and speak about. And he requested me to come and speak out of my book that he talked about. That's the book we are talking about. It's called Play to Win. And I would like to offer everybody here a free copy of the book, the ebook version. It's available for free at my website, softskills.co.ke. So if you go to soft skills, if you look at my background, you will see the word soft skills, that's the name of my company. If you go to softskills.co.ke, you will be able to download the book that we are talking about free of charge. The title of my sharing, my thoughts this evening is your unfair advantage. And like I said, it's brilliant that we were talking about winning just a few minutes ago. The book is entitled Play to Win. And so I'm talking to you about your unfair advantage. I'm going to share just a few slides here to guide my thoughts as I share this. I'm going to be keeping it very brief, but it's interesting. I was talking about how Anthony is a friend of mine. The way Anthony and I became friends is due to the recent pandemic that changed the way we operate. Now, the way I work is I, I run a training business. I am a speaker and therefore I speak spend the majority of my work life in front of an audience. And so when COVID came around, my business got crushed, completely crushed, it disappeared. I think the, on, the people who, there's a lot of other businesses that went bust, but I think it would take a hotelier to understand how much my business went down. We're not talking about a business dipping, we're talking a business vanishing altogether so that my, my revenue went to zilch, went to zero. I have a family to sustain and so, I don't want to go into the details of how devastating, how desperate I was at that moment. And I had to dig deep. I had to find what is it I have that cannot be taken away from me. That's the kind of thinking I want you to have while we have this discussion. I want you to be thinking, what is it that gives you an advantage? Now, I am sensitive to the fact that I am speaking to East Africans in this session and East Africans are very conservative. You will agree with me when I say that we are socialized to be humble. We are socialized to put down our own strengths. This is where I'm talking about you breaking out of the shell of how you have been raised, of how you have been socialized. Previously, my 90, about 90, 95% of all my interactions while with Kenyans, while face to face, I was speaking to people out of my own society, my own community, so it was easy to relate. Now come COVID and my business went online. Now I'm able to operate with audiences. I'm able to address people right from my desk, but I now interact with people from across the world. The interesting thing I have noticed is that as East Africans, we tend not to be loud about our strengths. We tend not to focus too much on what we are good at. We tend to play down so that if somebody pays you a compliment, you're almost apologetic about it. Think about it if this speaks to you. If someone tells you, oh, you do this very well, you say, uh, I try. If someone tells you you're looking very sharp today, you say, all glory to God. You're trying to focus the tension, attention away from yourself. Interact with a West African and you discover that that's very different. Interact with an American and you discover those people have a tiny little business and they say, I have a global business. I have international presence. But we tend to be very, very humble, very tiny. We try to make ourselves small. That's what I'm trying to get us to break out of in this discussion this evening. So I'm talking about your unfair advantage. If you break down the word unfair, it doesn't rub us very well as East Africans. We try to play it fair. We we hope that we try to be quote unquote very godly people. We, we hope that what I have, everyone else has. But when I talk about your unfair advantage, I'm talking about those things that you have 
in unfair proportions. What is it that God seems to have favored you with? I want you to have identified that at the end of this conversation. I want you to have learned how to play this to your advantage. When you talk about your unfair advantage, we are talking about your unique ability. We are talking your talent. We're talking your gifting. Whatever way you want to describe it, we are talking about that thing which you find easy to do that other people struggle with. There's an expression in English that says familiarity breeds contempt. You're probably able to sing and singing is effortless for you. And you think that singing is not a gift. You think we all, most of the time we tend to look down on our own abilities on those things that God has endowed us with. And what, how does that come about? That mainly comes about because we compare ourselves with others. I remember reading something interesting that if you were going to judge a fish by its ability to climb trees, it would fail all the time. A fish needs to become better at swimming because that's what a fish knows how to do. I remember a conversation I was having at one point with a friend of mine whose daughter was a great singer. And I told her, hey, you need to put your child in music school. She does very, very well. And she told me, yes, I will do that as soon as she improves her grades. What's wrong with that conversation? A singer has no business doing well with her grades in school. Possibly the unfair advantage that God gave her was with the singing. So you want to better your best. You don't want to become average at everything. You want to better your best. Think of all the successful people that you know in the world. You will find they're known for one thing. They might end up doing a lot of other different things. If I say Bill Gates, you think software, you think computer. The guy does a million different things, but you think about one thing. So you want to ask yourself, what is this one thing that we know you for, that, we, that whenever this thing is mentioned, your name comes to mind. So that is what I want you to be able to, to identify. Now, you might want to ask yourself, why play? And we're just having this, uh, we're just listening before I started to speak about this uh, recording on, on, on winning. You might want to ask yourself, why be competitive? Because you don't have a choice. Life is a contest. Life is a contest. Everything you're able to do, I say this all the time when I'm addressing Kenyan audiences, but I think it's relevant just as much for Ugandans. Whatever job it is you, you do, whatever business it is that you, whatever service, whatever product that you, that you, that you bring to the marketplace, you can be replaced by at least 10,000 people within five minutes because there is so many people who are able and willing to do a better job than you for half the salary that you make, for half the profits that you make. So we do not have a choice. We have to be competitive in what we do. We have to ask ourselves, what am I bringing to the table? And is it the absolute best? Also, it's a good idea to realize that we get as much as we earn. We get as much as we earn. You want to be able to offer better than you're being paid for. Whether you're earning a salary or whether you are making a profit, you want to give better because that keeps you ahead of the competition because if you're just doing as much as everybody else is doing then you will find that you're not competitive and you will very soon be washed away now when I talk about take action, and this is a chapter in the book that I'm talking about, and I've offered this book, and I'm going to put a, a, a link in the, in, the, in the chat so that you're able to download the book for yourself. It has an entire, action, uh, an entire chapter entitled Take Action. And my summary of this is moving from knowing what to do to doing what you know. My easiest example of this is usually with weight loss. If you have ever seen a weight loss, an overweight person, if you have ever been overweight yourself, then you know that it's not for lack of knowing what to do. Everybody, even an eight-year-old child knows that if you eat less and if you're more active, you're going to lose weight. So it's not a function of knowing. Sometimes we become so caught up in getting more information. Let me read more about it. Let me research this more. Let me become better at this by learning, 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 where we are trying to get perfect before we even start. One action is a lot better than years and years of learning. So once I've identified what I'm good at, you want to be able to act. You want to be able to act. Most of the successful people in the world that you know will tend to be very action-oriented people. They are the kind of people who will try. They will fail and they will try again. So you would rather be trying and failing and trying once again than not trying at all and getting to just 
keep keeping on learning and learning and learning a lot of people it's called analysis paralysis it's called all sorts of names procrastination you can use any word you want but it stops millions and millions of good ideas from seeing the the light of day so the way you become better at what it is that is your unfair advantage. I gave the example of a singer. The way you become a better singer is by singing. I lost count long ago of how many people have sat down and discussed with how to write a book, how to become a speaker. And whenever somebody asks me, how are you going to become a speaker? I always tell them you become a speaker the same way you learn how to ride a bike. No amount of studying riding a bike or studying swimming will ever teach you how to swim. I like the story of one lady who told us this and I really admired her because she was at least 45 years old when she went to the pool for the very first time to try and learn how to swim. And so she gets there, she changes, she goes to the pool and the instructor tells her, all right, jump into the pool. And she said, hey, no, 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 no. I told you it's my first lesson. I don't know how to swim. She said, yeah, yeah, that's what we're here about. Get in the pool. And when they had back and forth about once or twice, she, she listened to herself and she discovered, actually, I will never learn how to swim until I get wet. So when we say take action, we are saying, get in the pool, get on the bicycle. You will only ever learn how to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle, not by studying how to balance, not by studying the best kinds of bicycles, none of that. It's when you begin to do this thing that you become better at it. So whatever it is that needs doing in your life, it's action that will change it. It's action that will move you from where you are now to where you want to be. Now, whenever you want to play your unfair advantage, there will always be a price to pay. There will always be a price to pay. There is no time when you are going to find that it's, it comes to you free and the price is very rarely in cash. If it was in cash, it would be a lot easier to pay. So the way you become good, the way you become great at what it is that you like to do, the price that you're going to pay, I put on a few points here and the first one is time. That was actually said in the recording that ran before me. You are going to have to give it a lot of time. You're going to have to change the way you prioritize the things that you do because it is, there's a direct relationship between what you're good at and how much time you give it. You want to spend time doing this thing. You want to spend time studying this thing, whatever it is that is your unfair advantage. If, for example, I take, and I'm Kenyan, so this is an easy example. If I am gifted in running, and Kenyans are long distance runners, my success in the marathon or in whichever race I'm going to be running is not so much dependent on the gifting that I had, on the talent that I had. It's much more dependent on how well I practiced. There is a much, if, if you're going to put talent against practice, I would bet on practice anytime because the person who has spent the most time practicing, the most time honing their craft will end up being very good at it. So the first price you want to pay will be in time. The next is consistent self-development. You have to get in the driver's seat of your life. I like to call self-development what begins when academic studies end. The study of how to become a better human being. I have to be a consistent self-development study all the time. There is, and nowadays it's easy to do. Even when you don't like to read, you can play. There is millions upon millions of videos on YouTube. And like Anthony said, I have a channel myself and I'm sure the spelling of my name is somewhere on your screen. If you go to YouTube and type in Christine Wetelli, I would actually appreciate if you would subscribe. I upload new videos every Sunday. And that is a lot of personal development. My, my channel is all about uh, life lessons. The title actually of my, my channel is Life Lessons. And I just share different life lessons every, every Sunday. And that's absolutely free of charge. There's a lot that you can learn without spending a penny. So the price for that one is time more, much more than it is in, in shillings or dollars. Another thing you will have to take care of is your friends. Who are you around? You are the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. The first time I had this concept, I was reading a book on business. I'm very sure all of you will be familiar with the Rich Dad books. There's a book by Rich Dad I was reading called The Cash Flow Quadrant. That's a book about investing, about stocks and stuff like that. And somewhere in the middle of the book, he says, stop reading. Take a pad and paper and write down five of the people you spend most of your time with. Number one, just the family, that's just family. But put down five of the people you spend most of your time with. 
I remember not going to number four or five. My problem was with number one because I was told I am the average of the five people I spend most of my time with. The person I spent most of the time with at that point in my life was a lady who was a lot of fun to be around, but she was very negative energy. I'm sure you have people like that in your friends, friendship circle. You have people like that in your family, people who know why your idea will not work. People who know why you shouldn't even try. People who know why the economy is going to the dogs. People who know why everything is wrong. You don't need such toxic people in your circle. You really don't need such people in your circle. They are costing you your life. So another price you will have to, to pay, sorry, to be able to play your unfair advantage is you will have to edit your list of friends. And listen, the message that I'm giving is not for everybody. Let's get that out of the way right now. This is not a message for everybody. So you want to edit your list of friends. Another thing you want to do is to improve your communication skills. If you could improve just one skill, and as you can see there, my company is called Soft Skills Limited. I teach soft skills. If I could tell you just one skill to improve, to better your business, to better your life, your career, whatever, the one thing I would ask you to improve would be your communication skills. If you could just improve your communication skills, everything else would be a lot better for you. Everything else will be a lot better for you because you are only as good as how well you communicate. Whether you want to rise in your career, whether you want to do well in business, it's not the best product, it's the best presented pro product. It's not the best case that wins in court, it's the best presented case. It's who tells the best story, it's who communicates the best. And that's a whole other topic for another day. But you want to improve your communication skills. And like I said, how do you get better at communication? By communicating. Take the opportunity whenever they say, can we have a volunteer open with a word of prayer? Volunteer. Can we have someone make this presentation for our department? Be the one who volunteers. Put yourself in front of the camera. Now, I do not even have enough time to talk about being online. You have to be online. You have to have a presence on the internet. You have to be intentional and deliberate about what you're saying because these are the things that represent. If you go to a job interview today, if your company is going to be slotted for a particular tender, particular project, the first thing people will do is they'll Google you. So ask yourself, what do people find when they Google me? How do you find out? Google yourself. If you forget everything I say in this session, you might want to Google yourself. See what comes up when you Google yourself. Is there something you want to take down? Is there something you want to add? You want to make sure that your presence online is selling you because if you have to get into the room to sell yourself, it's already too late. Remember we said there's at least 10,000 people who can replace you at whatever job you want to do. So if you want to play the advantage unfairly in your favor, then you want to be able to be found online. You want your communication skills to be A1. And fifthly, you want your etiquette, the way you conduct yourself. You want that to be great. That is both online and offline. You want to make sure that, and when I talk about etiquette, I usually like to break it into communication etiquette, dress etiquette, and dining etiquette. You want to be able to conduct yourself as the top minority, wherever it is that you are, you want your presence, you want your brand to be so much better. So that's about the price you have to pay in order to play your, your, your advantage, your unfair advantage. Now, I put a few notes here concerning the management of your time because I think that is such a key area in our discussion. And you might want to ask yourself, what's the value of your time? What is the value of your time? I want you to come up with a figure about what your time is worth per month. I want to assume that that is a, a lot higher than you're currently making because then otherwise we have to talk to your employer. Now, if you have come up with a number for how much your time is worth per month, divide that by 30 days and divide that by 24 hours or how many hours you work. I want you to arrive at a number that represents the value of your one hour. If you ever think about your time in terms of dollars or in shillings, then you will change the way you do things. If your value, if the value, if, let me just pull a number out of the air. If the value of my time was $500 an hour, if my value was $500 an hour, would that affect whether or not I take my cousin to a wedding where I don't even know the people getting married? Would that affect my decision to go for 
you know, social events and things like that, or to spend three hours just, you know, just scrolling my phone, that will affect it, won't it? If you are valuing your time, if the only thing that God gives us all fairly is time. So if you are going to think of your time in terms of dollars, then it would change the decisions you make concerning your time. Someone like that I work with says this, and I like when he says it, he says that on average, we live to be 75. Now in Africa, our, our life expectancy is not even 75 years, but let's be generous and assume that you will live to be 75. How many of those years have you already spent? How many days do you think this that is? When I first calculated 75 times 365, I was surprised because if you had asked me, I would have thought I have at least 100,000 days to be on earth. Hello, you don't. It's about 27,000 days. How many of those have you already lived? That changes your perspective on time, doesn't it? It changes the way you think about the things that you do. It changes the way you make decisions on who can be around you and who can't, because some people are a waste of time. Another question to ask yourself is, what is your personal prime time? It's very important if you're going to grow your career, your business, it's very important that you know what your personal prime time is. This is a biological function. Some people do well in the evening. Some people do well in the morning. Some people do well during the day. It's important for you to know your personal prime time. Mine is between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. That is when I write. That is when I prepare speeches. That is when I'm most productive and creative. You want to guard that time jealously. That is not time for you to be scrolling the internet. That is time for you to be doing those tasks that are most engaging of your brain. It's very important you know your personal prime time. What are avoidable distractions? These are things we know, phone calls and all of that. These are things that you know. And what are you doing yourself that you can delegate or that you can get a system to deliver. The reason you want to be very, very careful how you spend your time is because that's the only thing that is completely finite. Once time has gone, it will never come back. And if you're trying to better your best, if you're trying to play your unfair advantage, you want to be very keen on how you spend your time. But that's a whole other topic. I don't want to go too much into that. I talked about personal development. You might want to ask yourself, what are you listening to? It is recommended that you spend at least least one hour listening to something, the subject of your choice, but listening to something that will build you in your area of expertise. I, for example, I'm in the training business. I am in the personal development business. I will play at least one or two hours of videos of content that will build my knowledge base in that area. Things that have to do with my own personal development because you can never give out of an empty vessel. You have to make sure that you're replenishing your content, you're replenishing. A lion eats, I think it's an eagle that is said to eat fresh meat all the time. Make sure that you're consuming new information. Make sure you're hanging around people who are talking about uh, positive things. And if you're in this meeting, you're obviously the kind of person I need to be talking to because you're the kind of person who knows you want to develop yourself to grow. So what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you improving? What are you becoming better at? And about the company, I talked about this already. Who are the five people that you spend most of your time with? Who is your mentor? There are different areas of your life. You want to get a mentor for different areas of your life. You might have a mentor towards your career. You might want to have a mentor around your, your parenting. There's different, different areas where you want to have a mentor. It just be a good idea. I put a note there that eagles do not fly with chicken. So you want to make sure that you're, that you're, careful about who you're hanging with. And then there's the whole concept of delayed gratification. I know I'm talking about your unfair advantage. I know I'm talking about winning, but it's a good idea for you to focus on winning the war and not the battle. I referred to being Kenyan and being athletes and our country is famous for long distance running. And when you're running a long distance, you do not begin by running very fast because you're going to burn your energy. It's more about how long you can run than how fast you can run. So make sure that you are taking the time, make sure that you are thinking long-term, make, make sure that your, your decisions, your plans are long-term. Failure is nothing other than the chance to start again more intelligently. I say that my business went past, so I'm very familiar with having to pick up and dust off and start again. And that is just an opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Is it easy? Hell no. Do you knock yourself? Do you get bruised along the way? Of course you do. 
but at the end of the day, you come out shining. They were talking about athletics. They were talking about people who do well in the area of athletics. And I can assure you that none of these people have not failed. None of these people have not failed. I always say this, the cameras don't do very well when it comes to capturing the journey. The cameras tend to capture the end. The runner has been running for the last three hours, but they only capture the last 10 seconds. So we don't see the journey. This person possibly fell and had to get up. This person got drained and had to drink water. This person needed help from a colleague, encouragement from a colleague. There's a lot of steps that you go through towards winning. So these are just a few pointers to help you to understand what is my unfair advantage how am I able to identify, say, that the unfair advantage, and how can I take it to my, to the next, to the next level? I talked about communication. Just a little pointer there on communication. You want to improve your listening. You want to improve your spoken communication as well as your written communication. But most of all, in this generation, you want to be sure that what you are placing online it represents you correctly. You want to make, because your brand becomes how you sell yourself. Your brand becomes how you sell yourself. And before I invite some questions, maybe I just display this, uh, where was I? If you follow that link, then you will be able to download the book Play to Win. You'll be able to download the book Play to Win. It's absolutely free of charge. My, my YouTube channel, that, that's the name right there. And my email address is there. If you just drop me an email, I can send you the, the link for the book if you don't have it already. So I'd like at this point to go back to Anthony so that we see if there are any questions. Thank you so much for your question. Um, I, I probably ran very quickly and I probably did not unpack what I mean by unfair advantage. When I talk about your unfair advantage, I'm talking about that thing which you do better than everyone else. In other words, if you are a great photographer, you should so, you should so shine at taking photographs that there is no comparison, that, there, that, that when we're looking for a photographer, it's a no brainer, you're the one that we go to. And that's an interesting example that you give because now, while I admit to having a very, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that in our culture here, academics are very far overrated. And that is what I was talking about to my friend whose daughter was a singer, except she's focusing on, on her academics. Now, it's interesting that you should talk about photography because I have a daughter who's a photographer. And when she started to take photographs, she had just finished high school. And so she told her father and myself that I would like you guys to buy for me a camera. Uh, the first thing she told us was, I want to become a pot. She said she wanted to be, uh, I think she said a fashion photographer and we asked her what in the world is that? And she gave us the details and told us she wanted to go into photography in the fashion industry. And she wanted us to buy her camera. And when she described the camera she wanted to buy, we said, oh my goodness, that's an investment. And we told her, do you want us to pay the university or to buy a camera? She said, I would rather you buy a camera. That's told me that she's very serious about it. We actually bought her camera before we paid her university fees. She has been into photography ever since, and she has since gone into full-time since she graduated, that's a few years ago, and she's gone into full-time photography. Now, if I had thought like my parents, and possibly some of you here of my generation, and therefore you know how our parents would think, they would tell you focus on your academics. Now, she was able to go through university while taking photographs. By the time she graduated, she had already had four years of experience in photography. She had already uh, made a lot of contacts. And to, so it was a very smooth transition into the business of photography. Um, when I'm talking about, and great examples here were given of basketballers who ended up becoming world-class basketballers. And the only way they did that was they gave it so much attention that anybody who looked at them thought they were selfish, thought they were one track minded. Remember, do not, and I already gave a disclaimer. I said, as East Africans, we are socialized to look for approval. You will not get to where you want to get while people still think you're a nice person. While people still think you're a balanced person. Stop trying to be balanced, try to be, to excel. For you to excel in one thing, it has to get your number one attention. 
it, you can't be trying academics and trying singing. You will become C at both of them. If you want to become A at something, it must get your first attention. So if I were you, I would give my first attention to photography. I would give my first, I would give at least 90% of my time of my energy on photography, especially when you're trying to get it off the ground, because that is the only way that you will succeed. You will never succeed. Somebody put it this way and I agreed completely. Plan B never works. If plan A doesn't work, make plan B plan A, because plan B never works. You know, in, in our country here, it's called your side hustle. Your side hustle never makes money, it never works. You will only ever make a hustle work if you make it your main gig so that that becomes what you're doing. It's your plan A that works. So if you want to excel at photography, my suggestion is this, make photography your plan A. I hope that answers the question, Gertrude. Very interesting. In my personal opinion, your mentor is somebody who has been where you're trying to go and is willing to hold your hand. I'm going to say that again. Your mentor is someone who has been where you're trying to go and is willing to hold your hand. How do you find a mentor? You make yourself useful to your mentor. A lot of the times we approach people and tell them, I would like you to mentor me. Say, for example, I wanted to go into politics in our country. And I reached out to Uhuru Kenyatta and told him I would like you to mentor me. Where would Uhuru find time to mentor me? Find a way to become useful to Uhuru. That way Uhuru will be mentoring you. Because you don't learn from your mentor by listening to your mentor. You learn by observing your mentor. And how would you observe your mentor? By working with them. Make yourself useful to them. Don't look to get, look to give. There are a lot of times when we could do very well if we allowed ourselves to start from the beginning, to start from the bottom. Let me go back to the example of my daughter, and I'm not saying that this is just e easy examples because she's in my family. And when she was starting her photography business, she shadowed successful people in the area that she was going into. She offered free services. She became the person who takes the behind the scene pictures. She became the person who assembles the, the, the equipment. She became the person who carries the equipment. She did a lot of free things for the people that she was learning from before she was able to launch her own photography business. So the way you find a mentor is identify somebody who has been down the road and offer services to them, become useful to them. Interesting thoughts, Anthony, interesting thoughts. Now, when you talk about location, um, definitely location makes a big difference and you give a, a great example. You might want to move where the, uh, the advantages are. You might want to move where the advantages are. Don't be very rigid. Sometimes we get stuck where we were born. You think because I was born in Nairobi, I must live in Nairobi. Because I was born among these people, I must stay with these people. You might want to relocate. A lot of times you will need, and relocating may not be physical relocation. You might want to move your thoughts. You might want to move your company, your conversations from the comfort zone in which you have been raised and socialized. So location does play a big role. If, you're, if you're, the particular kind of business you want to be in is going to do a lot better in another country, in another part of the country, by all means move there. So does location play a part in your unfair advantage? Yes, it does. I like that you talk about luck. Lack, in my opinion, and this is a quote, I'm not saying this is original to me, I'm sure you've heard it before, is when opportunity meets preparedness, when opportunity meets preparedness. Barack Obama is an excellent example. Bill Gates is an excellent example. Has it ever occurred to you that when Bill Gates went with his mother to this board of IBM, there were other members of, of IBM, there were other people whose parents were on that board, but he's the one who took action. He's the one who took advantage of that. So in whatever location you are, in whatever network you are, there will be a lot of other people. But how will that work to your advantage if you act on it, if you recognize that this is my unfair advantage? I have a mother who will take me to the board meeting. That's my unfair advantage. That is what I have above the other children in my class. Play that to your advantage. That's what I'm trying to say.
Obama was a Kenyan born in America. How many Kenyans are born in America? All of us could write a list of 100 people from, from their country, Uganda or Kenya, who live in America, who've had children in America. There's millions of children like that, but he's the one who played it to his advantage. He's the one who took what he has. When we're talking about your unfair advantage, we're saying, find what you have, because everybody has something. Is it where you were born? Is it what you know? Is it who you know? Is it what you do well? Is it the contacts that you have? There is something that gives you some leverage against other people. That's what I'm saying, play to your advantage. If it needs for you to, to move your location, then that's what we are calling pay the price. If the price means that I don't live next to my cousins and my aunties, that I go and start an absolutely new life and freeze in Canada, but if my that's where my opportunities are found, then that's the price I have to pay to be able to play my unfair advantage. I hope that answers your question, Anton. Yeah, 